And I am Tip McKnight from Pensacola, Florida, and practice with Center for Sight. And I uh, want to talk a little bit about the expand ring this morning. Uh, I want to talk about three things. First, we'll talk about the basic insertion technique, and then I'll talk about where I specifically find the expand ring helpful. And then finally, just a few little tips or pearls. So the injection technique is to uh, install the initial uh, foot at the distal iris. And, and uh, when I first started with the ring, the, the key thing to learn was not like our intraocular lens injecting from the incision site, but actually inserting the injector almost to the center of the pupil to more carefully and precisely place the foot plate. Then the next step is just placing the lateral feet, and I've found that sometimes it comes out such that both feet will seat simultaneously and effortlessly. If not, usually one will want to go in the right place, and so I'll just tilt, tilt my wrist to get the first one in and then tilt the other way to get the second one in. And then the, the next step is simply, as you can see there, to, to drop the trailing foot right on the iris surface. and. A uh, great instrument, the Williamson manipulator, or very similar to a Kuglin hook, but a little bit smaller and a little bit more polished, uh, to just drop the final uh, foot behind the iris. And then you can see it centers beautifully. That's one of the nicest things about the, about the ring is that it centers so perfectly. And uh, we obviously want the FACO and the IA tip to go directly through over the, the proximal foot plate. If it's not that way, the Williamson ring will very easily allow you to rotate a few degrees to get it just right. And then when it comes time to remove the ring, uh, what we do is, is simply reverse the process. Just take the proximal uh, foot plate, lay it on the surface of the iris, uh, and then remove the lateral and uh, the, both lateral uh, feet, and then uh, simply uh, grasp the, uh, the ring on the surface, the iris, and, and bring it back through the wound. Uh, so I just thought I would review the different uh, times when I find the, the ring particularly helpful. First is uh, floppy iris syndrome. Uh, the, uh, it's also really helpful in small pupils in our premium IOL patients, uh, diabetic patients, uh, patients with posterior synechia. Um, those on anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents, uh, those with iris neovascularization. Uh, of course, pseudoexfoliation patients and people who tend to have a tight lid anatomy. So first with the floppy iris, uh, the eight points of fixation are especially helpful with the floppy iris patients because many times I'll encounter a patient where you look pre-op and you think the pupil will dilate adequately. But as you get in there, it's like a little hurricane like we experience on the Gulf Coast and the iris is really whipping around and uh, uh, can try to come out the incision. So the expand ring with the eight point fixation really holds it nicely in place. Um, the couple of other tips are that uh, I'll typically make the incision a little further anterior with the IFAS patients. And then also the tunnel, not quite so long, because if there's a long tunnel and you're really anterior, then you can get some dimpling of the cornea during the case. Uh, another category that, that's really helpful is in the small pupil uh, premium IOL patients. These patients obviously expect perfection, and rightfully so. Um, so what I've found is that you really need to preserve the, the pristine corneal surface in these patients. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, so that their healing will be much better. They want to see 2020 the first day post-op. They want to go home that night and rest and not have any discomfort. Um, and uh, for intraoperative aberrometry, you really need a great corneal surface to get just the perfect intraoperative aberrometry with the aura or, or whatever system it is you're using. And uh, we've encountered patients where you're not using the ring and sometimes it's a little bit small, you don't get quite as accurate aberrometry or you have a bit of trouble uh, aligning your toric IOL or if the pupil comes down during your toric IOL case uh, and you can't get a reading with your aberrometer, then you also can't see any marks you may have placed for alignment. So the expand ring, if we just use it straight out of the gate, then it really just expedites your case and makes it flow smoothly. The other thing is the family, if they're watching on a monitor in another room, it's kind of the biggest wow effect you see. The family loves watching the expand ring go in and out, and it's much more elegant than fighting a small pupil the whole case, and uh, especially compared to the uh, iris hooks, that those uh, do not present well to the, the family on video. The, the iris hooks tend to cause a little uh, psychological discomfort. 
Um, the other thing is with the expand ring, I've found that the pupil will return almost always to a very natural uh, configuration postoperatively, where unless you really, really look carefully, uh, sometimes even on day one, you cannot see where the, the expand ring was in contact with the iris. And it may not seem like much, but if patients have these premium IOLs, they, they need some reactivity of their pupil for, for reading vision. It can be really helpful. And if you have somebody with a light blue iris, if there's anisocoria, um, the patient will not be so happy about it if their, their pupils are different size. And so this really helps to ensure that you, you have no uh, peak pupil, no anisocoria post-op. Uh, diabetic patients, we find uh, we have retina specialists who's been very active over the years and I'll encounter many patients who have had panretinal photocoagulation. The, the edge of the iris is somewhat fibrotic. And uh, in my, my experience, some of those you could stretch just with uh, bimanual manipulation and get enough to get through your case. The, the issue I see with that is sometimes iris will bleed and I truly believe, though we've not proven, that you much better preserve the, the blood iris barrier so you don't have leakage of red blood cells, white blood cells, and various inflammatory factors into the anterior chamber. And it'd be nice for someone to do a study on this at some point, uh, checking flare uh, post-op at the slit lamp to just quantitate whether uh, that's truly the case. But that's my clinical impression is you get a lot less flare uh, post-op in, in these patients. And who knows, it may lessen uh, the incidence of, of diabetic or cystoid macular edema post-op. Again, I don't, can't prove that, but that's my clinical impression. Um, iritis patients, again, many of these patients have very fibrotic irides uh, from long-standing chronic iritis, and some of them you can get away with simply stretching the pupil or they'll dilate a little bit, but I've found that the iritis patient, their pupil will often come down uh, during the case and, and often at just the wrong time. So if we go ahead and put the expand ring in at the outset, uh, it seems to be much less traumatic. And again, less inflammation on the first post-op day. And I think I'm using less steroids in these patients. And uh, again, don't know, but I think we may get less macular edema uh, in those patients by being as atraumatic as possible to the iris. Uh, Pseudoexfoliation patients, I, I know that there's talk of capsular support with the, the expand ring, and I've not personally done yet that that yet, but I'm very interested to do so. Uh, I do find it very useful in pseudo-exfoliation patients because it lets me get the full 6.7 millimeter dilation, and then you can better inspect. I'll even use the Williamson hook and push on, before I make my capsular excess, push on the edge of the lens and just look, and you can really see how much is it wobbling, what are the zonules like, and then kind of get in advance an idea of if you're going to use a capsular tension ring in some of these patients so that the tech can go ahead and have your capsular tension ring preloaded. Uh, and then when you go to put in a CTR with this ring already in place, you can visualize it much more directly and be sure you're getting it in very smoothly and, and, uh, and efficiently. Uh, anticoagulants, antiplatelets, uh, iris neovascularization. Uh, what, what I find with that is that with the eight point fixation, it's not common for me to get bleeding or any significant bleeding. With, with some of the other devices with single point hooks or with uh, a bit of a pinch to the iris, you can absolutely get some bleeding and that can, that can certainly interfere with your case and, and become enmeshed in the, in the viscoelastic. Uh, the other place uh, is with, with tight lid anatomy. Some patients where they've got a lot of uh, uh, really, really tight lids, really deep set eye, or maybe there's a lot of adipose uh, tissue there, it can be very difficult to put the four point uh, uh, manual hooks in uh, because uh, it, you just can't get in there to operate. Or if you get it in and then the patient starts looking around or they have a Bell's phenomenon and look up, it can really cause quite an issue and you can even lose capture. And, and this, of course, is not a problem with the expand ring. Also, uh, I've found that when you do the multiple paracentesis to place hooks, if you have one that's just a little bit off or a little leaky, and you've got that patient who's in ophthalmic, deep set eye, you can get a bit of a lake, and that makes your job, job a bit harder. So I really like not having to do the additional paracentesis. So I'll move on in closing to just a few tips. Uh, one thing I've found helpful is just to uh, mark on the chart before the case 
uh, as best I can tell who's going to uh, be a candidate for the expand ring. It, it, that way the tech has everything prepared. And we've gotten away from overutilization of drops. Sometimes in the past, the nurses would say, I've put in six sets of drops. Do you want me to do another one? And then, of course, that patient's going to be very uncomfortable when they get home. And the corneal epithelium has really, really been traumatized and have even seen some cases where you're starting to get a little opacity on the epithelium, which can make your aberometry uh, difficult. So I find uh, less sloughing of epithelium and better post-op day one uh, visual acuity. Um, this other one is obvious, but um, I'm sure I've done it and I'm sure everyone will do it once. Uh, we tend to use whatever instrument your technician hands you and they hand you the IA before you've taken the ring out, you will remove the viscoelastic and then have to put it back in to get the ring out. So that's uh, not a huge deal, but we all make that, that mistake once. Um, if you're reusing the device, uh, it, it is so light that it's best to, to hold it on the uh, Williamson ring or whatever you're using to, to remove the ring uh, to pass it off into a, a sterile cup because the, the ring is so small and it's so uh, difficult to see on an on operating room table, especially for us presbyopes, that, that you're, you're much better just handing it off on the device uh, like, a, like a ring on a pencil. Um, and then the, the question that, that often comes up is how much more time is it going to take you to use this device? And uh, what I've found is it actually saves me time because, uh, you know, in the past with technologies that you're not that big a fan of, you say, well, I don't really want to deal with uh, using a pupil expander. Let me just work through the case and we'll use it if needed. Then you wind up using a lot more fluid, a lot more corneal edema on post-op day one, and then it actually takes longer to... to break everything out, get ready to put in your accessory devices, as opposed to just going straight from the outset and uh, putting the expand ring in. And uh, that's basically it. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy using the device.